Let the countdown begin. The launch of a Northrop Grumman and Terry's rocket and Cygnus cargo spacecraft set for 5.56 p.m. tomorrow evening from NASA Wallops Flight Facility. That's awesome, and I've quickly learned, of course, that NASA Wallops is such a treasure here on Delmarva, and in fact, a lot of that research that paved the way for man to travel to space was actually done there in our own backyard. In our own backyard. In today's Monday Memories, Lisa takes us back to her Wallops visit about six years ago when they were celebrating then 70 years of all things space. Although NASA Wallops Island is celebrating its 70th anniversary, the facility's history began a few years before 1945. The whole origin of, of the, the, the base here was really stemmed out of the beginning of World War II. T.J. Meyer is an environmental restoration program manager for NASA, but he's also an unofficial historian. He says operations began here shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor. There were growing concerns over German U-boats threatening the East Coast. By the end of uh, 1942, uh, the, de the Defense Department realized they needed to have more protection, and so they started to create these small bases, both to do training of new pilots and also to run submarine patrols, anti-submarine patrols. The Chincoteague Naval Auxiliary Air Station was home to two torpedo bomber squadrons. Meyer says a young pilot named George Herbert Walker Bush was trained here. Following World War II, the Naval Aviation Ordnance Test Station was established to test new types of ordnance, planes, and missiles. And some of the guided missiles that are still in use today were the Sidewinder, uh, which is a, a common one that people hear about all the time, and the Sparrow, still used. I mean, it's obviously an advanced, but the basic missile is still being used today. In 1945, NASA's predecessor, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, established a rocket launch site called Wallop Station. Those early launches were test rockets, really just to prove the principle that they could actually start to test rocket uh, launching from, this, the, from the island. In the early years, research at Wallops concentrated on collecting data at transonic speeds. Was they wanted to go beyond the speed of an airplane, but not supersonic. They wanted to go what they call transonic, and they wanted to study what was happening in that phase. In 1959, NASA took over the former Naval Air Station, eventually renaming it Wallops Flight Center. Project Mercury capsules were tested in support of NASA's manned spaceflight program. Some of the early work that we did back in the very early 60s was we launched a couple of types of rockets here. One was called the Little Joe that had the manned capsule on top of it. And the whole goal there was to launch that and see how the recovery of the parachutes work. In fact, two rhesus monkeys were sent aloft in these capsules. Both were recovered safely. Wallops continued to grow the next couple of decades. In 1982, Wallops was consolidated with the Goddard Space Flight Center and became NASA's preliminary facility for suborbital programs, launching more than 16,000 rockets over the years. The facility also supports science missions for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And although many viewed the end of the space shuttle generation as an end to space discovery, facility director Bill Robel says it's just the beginning. We're kind of on the ground floor of uh, what, you know, years from now will become some kind of a flagship mission or, or the next uh, big instrument. Um, and in the case of like manned space flight, uh, while we probably don't do the same things that we did, say, in the Apollo era, um, there's still enough interesting things because it's a large amount of it is now commercial. NASA's sounding rocket program provides vehicles for space and Earth science research. It's where you try things out. You'll, you'll break a few things. Some things will work great. Uh, you'll find things maybe don't work out exactly the way, but you get it back and you can go ahead and adjust or make adjustments to, to whatever it is, come back and fly again. Got main engines at 108 percent. Avionics powered on. One high-profile example of that was the October 2014 failure of the Antares rocket launch. It's the reality of aerospace that from time to time things aren't going to work out, but you prepare for the eventuality that it, that it does. NASA's Airborne Science Program provides aircraft systems for a wide range of scientific research. I think in the last couple of years we've flown you know, better than 2,000 hours, I mean, no kidding flight time. Uh, testing out, again, the instruments or taking measurements uh, of, of the Earth's uh, ice 
in the different polar regions. And unmanned missions to investigate hurricanes in the Atlantic. They're getting enough really good data off of that that, they, that NOAA has now picked it up and they want to continue to fly those and so it's coming back this summer. Uh, Along the way, the scientists at NASA Wallops Island continue to host students and educators to be sure the missions here continue through generations to come. Because here, the sky is not the limit. I think with things like uh, Antares and Space Station Resupply, I, I don't know that there's any limit to things that we, that we can do. No limit whatsoever. As a matter of fact, the Cygnus that is set to take off tomorrow will have over eight thousand pounds of research, crew supplies, and technology on it. Oh, and by the way, mm -hmm. did you happen to know it, it, the SS Ellison Onizuka is the name of it, honoring a former astronaut, the first Asian American astronaut. Wow. That launched just before 6 o'clock, 5.56 p.m. Wow. We'll let you know all about it. Wow. Good stuff, right? And good pronunciation of that name. You nailed it. How could you not know Dr. Onizuka? Yeah. I don't even know if he's a doctor.